think we're all set to go. So welcome everybody to Sizo Lunch. Uh, today we have Shabin Shu to present. Uh, Shabin um, got his uh, undergraduate degree at Nan, uh, which one? Nanjing. Nanjing University in China in the School of Earth Science and Engineering. He then did his PhD at the Earth Observatory of Singapore uh, at Nanyang Technological University. And a lot of his uh, PhD research is focused looking at fault processes both modeling and looking at data as well. Uh, most recently, he's been doing a postdoc here at UW in Marine's group. He arrived in March, yep. spring of last year. In March. And so today he's gonna present some of that initial uh, postdoc work that he's been doing. And the title of this talk is Improved Teleseismic Waveforms Using Transfer Learning and its Application on Estimating Rupture Parameters of Deep and Intermediate Depth Earthquakes. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, so I don't need to introduce myself again. Um, so today I'm going to show um, some of my um, uh, preliminary results on using the machine learning technique uh, to separate earthquake, earthquake signals from the noise and uh, to estimate the source characteristics from the denoise waveforms. So this title is um, improving the telesasmic wave. So today we mainly focus on the telesasmic waves. I know um, here many people are, may, are very familiar with local seismic data, but here it's a I think it's a different topic that um, we focus on the global seismic data. One reason is that um, we want to derive a model, a derived machine learning technique that can be generalized to the global data set. We don't want uh, this technique only focus on one region or one type of data. We want this uh, method to be generalized. So. So this is a um, uh, main motivation of this work. So um, first I wanna start with the concept of machine learning. So what is machine learning? It's uh, actually a subset of AI technology. Some people call it a, some people may consider it as a statistical model, but it's more complicated than a statistical model because you can do some um, task much difficult than the statistics of the data. So here our target of using a machine learning technique is that we can um, allow the machine to make some predictions for different kinds of data without a specific programming of that task. So this method can be generalized to different data. And uh, the, on the figure on the right shows a very uh, well-known um, categories of three main type of uh, machine learning algorithms. Two of them are um, supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is um, the training of the machine with label data. For example, we have labeled P and S waves. Then we, we can train a machine learning model to uh, let it predict P and S waves with labels. And uh, the unsupervised learning is more complicated. We don't have labels for this uh, machine learning technique. For example, we can do earthquake clustering. Uh, we, we have a seismogram, then we input the seismogram to this uh, machine learning technique, then it will output something like, it's not a very specific um, parameter of the P wave time or S wave time. It gives you some relation, correlation between the different data sets. This is what we call the clustering. And the third uh, technique is the reinforced learning. It's uh, much more complicated, but we, ha we have a very well-known uh, example, which is uh, AlphaGo. Uh, developed by the company DeepMind. So this robot or this machine learning technique can beat the most smart Go player in the world. And the common, something common for these two category of method is that um, although some have labeled, some doesn't, something common is that they have, they, people need to assign a score for this machine learning algorithm. So the target of this training process is to improve the scores. So this is something common for the different um, category of, categories of the machine learning techniques. And uh, deep learning is even smaller subset of machine learning technique. It's simple, it's simpler because it doesn't have a very complex architecture. It's just stacking of uh, multiple linear and nonlinear layers. So a very basic uh, architecture of a uh, deep learning or deep neural network is that uh, we have a, a series of uh, 
linear and nonlinear operations. So here, what we see here is actually a, uh, a, a different layers of uh, operations. And each circle here represents the output of operation of each layer. And why do we need the nonlinear layers? Because we want this network to be deep. For example, if we do a series of linear operations, those this this series of linear operations can finally collapse into one linear operation, based on our uh, basic understanding of uh, linear algebra. So that's why we need a linear nonlinear activations between each each two uh, linear operations, so that this uh, architecture won't collapse, so that this network can be uh, can be deep. So the basic that of doing making a prediction that we input some data for this uh, neural network. We will do we will do first to a, a linear operation. Then after each linear operation, we will do a nonlinear activation. So this is <laughs> this is linear, and then skip to a nonlinear activation. So this is a step for one layer, and then we will repeat the same process but with different numbers or parameters for the second layer. Then we we'll do the third layer. So this is a basic step step for the um, prediction of the neural network. And eventually we'll get a set of or an array of uh, output. This output will be compared with our label data to see how similar uh, how, how, how similar is this output with our labels. And to com to achieve a good similarity, we we here we design a loss function which measures the difference between the the output prediction and the label data. Then our target of training for the training is to minimize the loss function. So after a long time of training, we expect to have a model that can predict a series of numbers that is very similar to our label data. So this is called the supervisor learning. Um, the way of optimizing the loss function is to do back project, uh, back propagation. The basic idea is that we have the loss or we have a mis mis we form misfit or the misfit between the predicted uh, period, period of arrival time and the label time. Then we can back, prop back propagate this error to the linear layers. Then update all the numbers, all the values of the parameters in each linear operation. And we don't need to train the nonlinear operation because nonlinear operation is always all simple. It's uh, mostly the selection between the three basic nonlinear operations. This is a uh, sigmoid. The, the, the formula is like written here. And uh, the most widely used is called zero function. It's almost linear line, but it's the only unique thing is that it has a, it will always out of zero if the input is, is a negative. So with a well-trained neural network, we can uh, do some uh, tasks such as uh, classification. For example, this is an example of using a um, different deep neural network called uh, YOLO3. You can do some human labeling on this image. So in this image, we have four person, four people. Then this machine learning technique can first find the margin of each person and mark them as person. And there's an object, the it's labeled as a different name, it's the small person. And uh, now the let's, let's uh, um, make a translation from this uh, picture recognition to the seismogram processing. I think seismogram is very similar to the image, although it has uh, one dimension to be zero. Uh, one, one, the length of one dimension to be one, although it's 1D, we can consider as 2D with the shorter uh, dimension to be uh, Length or to, to be the length of one. And uh, we can do a similar thing for the seismograms using these advanced techniques so that we can label label the P waves, S waves, or surface waves in this uh, input data set. So I want to start from a, uh, a, um, a technique called template match, which have been used for many years. It's actually a very basic machine learning model. Maybe some of us. Haven't haven't realized that. So let's start with the vanilla neural network. Neural network. Vanilla means that uh, it's a uh, original one, original one. It's simple. It's only one layer, and it's only a simple linear operation with a simple activa activation function. So here, 
Uh, for example, we, we have a task to classify the handwritten digits 0, 1, 2, 3. We want to identify uh, the number from the handwritten digit image. So what we do is that first we um, convert this image to, to a, a long array of values represent the black and white uh, value, the black, black and white value of each pixels. We flatten this 2D uh, 28 by 28 image into a uh, long array at the length of, with a length of 784 pixels. And each number in this long array represent the, the brightness or the, the color between black and white, uh, represent the colors of this um, image. Then we, we, we need to design a neural network model. So this part is the model we want to train. We want to, we want it to get with training. And uh, we want to do a linear operation between this input and uh, this linear matrix, just matrix. And we want to output a four number, an, an array of with four numbers. And uh, these numbers, the relative strength of the four numbers will tell us which one is the most probably, most possible number that we are looking at. So the most efficient way that is we don't do any training. We just make each, each row of this uh, matrix to be the same number as the template of zero, one, two, three. So for example, mm -hmm. you can imagine that uh, this input has this set of numbers and this is three. Then we use the last, we, we, we design a last column to be uh, the same number, same elements as the input data. And others can be random or others can be the same numbers as other classes two, one, zero. So this four row can represent zero, one, two, three. Then what we get after the linear operation is that it's actually doing calculation between this input data and the four rows. The final output will give us the four correlated coefficients between this input and the four rows. And the highest value represents uh, the, the, the score of each, each class. So by doing this, we can easily identify that uh, this is three because this number is maximum. And we, of course, we do some uh, activation. We, we, can, we convert these four numbers to a score. So this, this function for converting this to score is called top max. It's widely used the activation function here. So this is a basic idea of template match. Do you need to match when you're- Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Just write that. Yeah. Of course, we, we don't have, the, 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 the style of writing the, the, the digits is not uh, unique. We can have different writing styles. So we can have different ways of writing number zero and number three. So this means that uh, we have a group or cluster of number zero or cluster of number three. So, this, so here, we, 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 the question becomes more challenging is that we wanna classify, classify cluster by, by reading the data of a handwritten digit. So here we, we can do the same thing, but the optimal model is that the optimal choice of this, sorry. optimal choice of this uh, matrix is that we design the four rows, four rows of the matrix and each row represents the average template for each class. For example, the, the first row represents the average template of number zero and the last row represents uh, the average image of uh, number number three. So by doing this, uh, we can also uh, make some prediction, make some reliable predictions on the clusters. So this is a basic idea of, um, of using this template match algorithm as analogy to our uh, neural network model. Of course, um, when we do a template match for science programs, we don't know where the P wave or S wave are because the data is raw data. We never know the, the, the location of the waveforms. So we need to do one thing is that we use a small time window to scan through the seismogram for one day or for one month. So we use a similar idea here. We, for example, we make the handwritten digits smaller and make, it, make them at the different locations of the image. So this becomes more challenging because we first, we have to detect location of this uh, handwritten digit. Then after, after we uh, find the location, we uh, make a prediction which class it belongs to. So this process is actually two steps. First, we do a detection. Then we do a classification. 
So this is similar to our, um, uh, our classic template mesh method. And here we call it convolution. Actually, from the previous slides, we already know that it's actually doing cross correlation. But cross correlation is similar to convolution. The only difference is that whether we flip the template or not. You can see um, the difference between convolution and cross correlation here. So it's a similar idea between the neural network and template match. But there's a big problem for us is that what if we don't have enough templates? Now, without enough number of templates, we cannot to we cannot predict um, very accurately predict whether this is earthquake from this location. We cannot do that, but we can do a higher level task. For example, we can identify this as a, a strike slip event, or we can classify this earthquake as a um, mega thrust event. So we make this um, higher level. For example, here the, uh, uh, a small exam example here is that. We have 10 digit number, handwritten digit numbers, but we don't predict whether it's which number it is. We, we, we predict which cluster it belongs to. We can um, classify them into two cl classes. The first is small numbers from zero to four, and the second class is the large number from five to nine. So we want this neural network predict um, which, which group it belongs to, whether it's a small number or a big number. So the first, First, first thing we can think of is that we design a two row matrix and first row is an average template of zero, one, two, three, four. And the second row is average for the number five to nine. But in this case, we can expect that the template, if we convert the template to a 2D image, it will look like this because it's an average of different numbers. So we don't expect reliable, accurate prediction from this neural network. What we do is that we make it multiple layers. For example, first layer, we have 10 templates for 10 numbers. And second layer, we summarize the information from the previous layer and uh, make a prediction whether it's a small number, or big number. This is ideal. And this is just 10, 10 templates. But in reality, we don't, need, we don't really need 10 templates for the first layer. Maybe we only need three. And we need the two more uh, rows for the second layer. So totally we have five rows. We don't need the 10 rows of uh, matrix so that we're reducing the number in the neural network. So this can work. And it's proven that um, adding more and more layers will improve the capability of machine learning. You can, you can learn much more uh, complicated problem than fewer layers. So here, um, from the previous slides, we have uh, explained why we need a, I mean, for machine learning, why we need a convolution. Because we don't know where the P waves or S waves are in this recording. And why we need multiple layers, because we don't have enough templates. We, we want to make this problem more complex and higher level. So basically, we're using deep neural network. We are using deep convolutional neural network. Here we call it deep convolnet. And uh, here, using this slide, I want to ex ex expand uh, how this uh, convolutional neural network will work. So for example, we have an image of cat. We want a final output to be that uh, this is a cat. This is a class of cat. So the first image input to the convolution layer, layer one, the convolution layer one will summarize this part by doing convolution or cross correlation to summarize the information of this five by five pixel area to be one element for the output layer. And this output layer will be fit into the second layer. Then the second layer will do a similar thing to do a cross correlation for this three by three area and summarize it as a single element for the third layer. So this means that uh, the beginning layers will capture the small scale feature and the later layers at the end will capture higher and higher level of the features. So there's an example uh, from the computer vision is that, for example, if we give, give the machine an image of a person, the, the whole body, the first layer will, to capture, will be to capture the, the small, small details on the face, for example, the corner of the eyebrow or the corner of the ear. So this first layer will give you something like this, capture this feature. And the second layer, second layer will capture larger scale features 
or more complex feature, for example, the whole eye or the entire nose or the ear. And the third layer will summarize the information from the second layer and compose a more complete image of the face. And you can imagine that the, the, the next layer will, will have the, the half body, the size of the half body. And then the, the final layer will have uh, the whole body of the person. So by doing uh, multiple layers or deep cover net, we can very efficiently summarize the information or the features from the input data. But here we are, we are trying to use this technique to finally output a waveform, which where the noise has been already been removed. So our task is not to summarize all the information to make a prediction, oh, this is a P wave. No, we don't. We, we want more than that. We want uh, this network to predict the clean P wave by reading the noisy P wave. So which means input and, and the final, final output have similar size. For example, we have 100 seconds of P wave input, which is noisy. And then our final target is output 100 seconds of P wave, but it's clean with no noise. That means we need an architecture that, which is symmetric. We need to the final output to be the same size as the input. So here we adopt a very advanced uh, architecture called the UNET. The basic idea of UNET is just copy the input architecture of the input layer to the output layer. So here, what we do is that, first we, we stack a, a series of common, common net layers um, to summarize the information and compact all the information, downsampling all the features. And finally, we will have a small number of information there. It's a highly summarized information about the input data. And uh, for the output path, we use the same architecture, but different numbers because the it's a different uh, process. So we use different weights or different parameters in output path. Numbers vertically and numbers Yeah, I think this is an example, and uh, I can expand this. Um, I think one six four six four are, for, for example, the one number one is a number of input image or input data. It's one data, and we have sixty four filters or sixty four um, templates for this first layer, and. Uh, Next, we also fit, we still fit this uh, output to a 64 uh, layers or uh, 64 templates. So this is a number of filters or number of uh, templates. And uh, these numbers 572, 72 times 572 are the size of the image, the input data. How long is the seismogram? And uh, also the size of the templates. So those are numbers. And here we make sure that the, the, the forward path, the, the, the contraction or compaction path, summarizing process, and the expansion process has the same number of parameters, but they have different values. So this is the basic idea of UNET that it guarantees that it summarizes some information and output a, a seismogram with the same size of the input. But we, we should know that um, we should note that. Here, we summarize all the information and use this highly summarized information to make a modeling of P wave. That means we capture a first order feature. Then we, we expect that the model of P wave, maybe it's cleaner, but um, it's lower, lower, lower resolution because we, we, lose, we lose all the resolutions using this uh, highly summarized information. What we do is that uh, it's a very uh, magic technique, which, which is called a skip connection. This is to connect the input layers to the final output layers in a symmetric way. So that means the same, the information of the same size of feature will be um, combined with these output layers. So this will guarantee that the low, the, the high resolution details will be uh, reserved in the final output. So it's like a very, uh, Simple design, actually. It's, the idea is simple, but the, 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 final, the final performance of this neural network is very powerful. So this, this unit has already been adopted by uh, previous studies, is, which is also doing um, denoising or separating the noise from the seismic signals. Uh, what they do is that uh, they, they, they have a, 
additional procedure, which is to uh, first convert the time series size, time series time series size, size morgram to a time frequency domain. So they are not learning the features of the time series. They are learning the features of the time frequency domain of the seismograms. The reason they do this because, is because that by looking at the time frequency domain, you can easily identify the P wave or seismogram because it has a distinct feature from the noise. You can, you, you, you can distinguish these two, distinguish the signal and noise from this um, time frequency domain easily. So that uh, maybe this will um, increase efficiency of the training and make it easier to train the neural network. But here, um, we don't want to do this because, to, because of two reasons. First, we are focusing on the telesasmi waves. It has a strong attenuation for the high frequency signals. So which means we expect our data has overlapped frequency content between the, data, uh, between the signal and the noise. So it may not be easy for us to identify or distinguish the P wave and uh, the noise from the time frequency domain. This is the first reason. The second reason is the computation time. We um, here they they need to convert this time series to time frequency, then convert back to time series. So this is additional step, which is time consuming. We don't want to do that. So we only focus on time series. We only learn the features from a time series seismogram. So a method has already already been proposed by uh, Zhou Xing Ying, who was a uh, who was a PhD student with Marine at Harvard, and uh, the idea is also using using UNET, but they smartly um, using a two branch UNET because with a single UNET, what you are predicting is actually either P wave or uh, noise. If we want to predict P wave, you cannot guarantee that the noise you are predicting is accurate. So here they design a two branch. It's actually two units, but combined together, they share the same um, compacting path, which is using the same path, same um, model ten layers to extract the features from the data. But when they, after once they summarize all the information for the signal and the, the noise, they do modeling separately at two branches. So it's actually two units combined together. Yes. Uh, how certain you are that uh, the first output is purely perfect? It may contain noise. That's why we need labels. Yeah, we, we look at the similarity between the output and the P wave signal to make sure that uh, our trend model will predict uh, very simi similar P waves, clean P waves and clean signal, pure signals. So, so the input path, input path is a stack of um, convolutional layers and the output, output uh, path, two paths are symmetric, symmetric unit, same uh, number of parameters, but if just different values and uh, they have uh, well trained this model, and their model can well predict the P wave, uh, can well predict the local seismogram and uh, the noise. So, this is the performance they achieved. So, first, let's look at the top panel, top figure. The, the left column of this uh, top figure is um, the noisy data showing black, and the clean signal showing in, in red. The clean signal, the, the, the red waveform is actually a label we want to achieve. And uh, after the after input the data to the machine learning algorithm or neural network, it predicts the blue waveform for the P wave signal and for the noise. And we are actually plotting these um, predicted waveforms with the labels. They look almost the same, so we cannot uh, see the difference between them. And by doing the, by applying this to a magnitude the three event local event. Um, one can do better at STA LTA picking for the um, for the seismograms. You can see um, after denoising on the right panel after denoising, the waveform is is without uh, noise, and uh, the the prediction of the P wave arrival is of higher confidence. So let's um, look at this architecture again. So it has been proven that um, this architecture can capture the higher level feature first. This is the first we know. Um, and it has a very, very good capability of predicting the P wave signals and noise. So this is useful, very useful network. And now we wanted to generalize 
generalize this method to teletasking data, what we do is that we want to make it simple. We don't want to start from scratch. So we use the idea of transfer learning, um, which is that we add additional layers for the input and output. And we make the center the same architecture as uh, the previous neural network because we want to take advantage of the well-trained uh, model. So here we added a linear layer for as an adapter between the well-trained model and our new model. And we, of course, it should be symmetric. So we have linear layers, same, same uh, size of linear layers on the in, in, for the input and the output. And uh, this linear layer can allow us to uh, design any arbitrary length of the time window. For example, we can, with this linear layer, we can input the data with a length of 100 seconds for P wave, and we can input the data of 300 seconds for, for surface waves. So this will be, can be applicable to multi-scale of the data. So this is a function of the linear layer. And uh, we also add additional convolution layers to extract the lower level feature from the telesasmic wave. Because the low le lower level feature of telesasmic wave is very different from the regional data or local data. So th that's the purpose of adding these layers. And ideally, this, this architecture, after training, we will have uh, best values for all these uh, model parameters. And eventually, it will output a, a good Green's function for P and uh, the pure noise. So here we collect the data for this training. Um, because we are training for test test work. So we download the global earthquake catalog from ISC. And uh, they have um, lots of data in the past century. And uh, but we only extract the latest, the most recent data because we want to make sure the data quality um, doesn't uh, have negative effect on our training. So we, 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 we download data between uh, 2000, we download the earthquake for the time period of uh, 2000 to, to uh, 2018. And these earthquakes are larger than six because we are uh, extracting the data with high signal to noise ratio so that we can have a clean label. And with this clean data, clean waveforms, we can um, manually add noise to make it noisy. So this is the idea of training. We have labels, then we add noise to make it an input, make it as an input. So we, we input this man-made data to the machine. The machine will predict the label for us. This, this is the target. So uh, totally we have uh, 40,000, about 40,000 recordings, three component waveforms, P waves, uh, both P waves and S wave and the surface wave. Here, we only focus on P waves. And uh, with this data, we want to make it more diverse. Um, this concept has been accepted because if our data is uh, not diverse enough, the training will be less efficient. That, will, that means that uh, our training, after training, our model may be applicable to our own data set, but it's not a, cannot be generalized to other data sets. So we wanna, we wanna make the data more diverse. What we do is called the data augmentation. The first data augmentation proposed by Drew et al. is that um, they shift the, the location of the P waves in the time window for training. For example, here is an example that they have three uh, predictions based on the three models. The first model is a blue with no shift for the training. They always fix uh, the location of the P wave in the time window for the training. So once they shift the, the, the P waves to the right in, and input the model, it cannot make a good prediction because it's not trained that way. Because in the training, the, the P waves P wave is, is always fixed at a fixed location. So by increasing the shift, uh, shifting range, the performance of the model is better, especially for those data um, has a P wave at the beginning or the, at the end of the window. And uh, after shifting the signal, we, we, we add additional augmentation, uh, which are doing stretching because we are trained on the magnitude six, magnitude six earthquake. And we, we wanna make prediction for smaller magnitude or magnitude five or magnitude seven. Then for those smaller events, we expect smaller uh, source durations. So the size more of smaller events will have a shorter or higher frequency content or shorter durations on the pulses. So here we do a stretching step to make a data more diverse, to, uh, to mimic the lower, lower magnitude earthquakes. And after stretching, we stack the, the, the pre-signal pre noise. We extract the noise from the, the time window before the P wave and uh, make the same, same scale. We scale it up 
and then they add to the clean signal to make it noisy. So this black waveform is our man-made noisy waveform. We input this waveform and we have the clean label of the red, of the red here. Then we can uh, optimize this model to, to force it, make a good prediction on this uh, training data. So here it shows the training curve. It's a very smooth curve. Uh, we are surprised that uh, the training for us is uh, not as difficult as others because I think we, we have uh, considered two key factors here. First is the batch size. Batch size means that uh, how many, how many seismograms you are predicting at the same time to take an average loss function or waveform mismatch to optimize the model. The more data we calculate together with the average for one update of the model, the, the curve will be smoother. But this relies on how many data we have. Usually the, the batch size should be smaller than 5% uh, of the total data set. So if we wanna have a larger batch size, we need a larger data set. And the second thing, which is more important is the loss function. This is smooth uh, partly because we are using advanced uh, loss function. We have tried to uh, use the waveform mismatch, L2 norm between the two waveforms, predicted waveform and label waveform. And that will give, that will give us a very unsmooth, very uh, rough process of training. And so we, we, we think of, we, we, we started to think of um, a better way for the loss function, which is adding the cross correlation, correlation coefficients between the label and the prediction in the loss functions. So loss function is a combination of L2 norm and the cross correlation coefficients. So this will give us a very smooth curve. So after training, we test the performance on the test data. So this, those test data also have labels, but they didn't, they never participate in the training. So they are new, new data to the model, but we have labels. So the, the left panel shows uh, the original waveform. So the black is a man-made noisy waveform and the red is a label. And after the prediction, after we input the data to the model, you predict the blue waveforms as a P wave and as a noise. And we, we plot the predicted uh, waveforms with the uh, labels, they look very similar. And we also look at the, the spectrums of uh, the label waveform and the, the predicted waveform, they also look very similar. So this is an example. When you say P wave, what, what does this mean? Like what window size of the P wave? So uh, it, it, when we prepare the training data, the, the P wave is uh, 75 seconds before the arrival and the 75 seconds after the arrival. Yeah. I think it's long enough and uh, we don't have S wave mixed in this uh, window. So this example, um, if you look at the, the, the spectrum, this is actually an example where the noise has a lower frequency content than the signal. So it may be easier for the machine to distinguish between them and separate them. So next I'm showing a uh, example where the signal and noise has all has highly overlapped spectrum. So it, it's very difficult to separate them from the, from the uh, frequency domain by our eyes, but the machine can do that. So the prediction is in blue. Uh, when we plot the blue waveforms against the, the labels, it looks also very similar. And the spectrum also looks very similar. So they mean, this means uh, this, this training is uh, successful. It can well predict the, the, the clean P waves and noise, noises, which are overlapped in the frequency domain. Yep. Yeah, the second phase. Uh, it's actually S wave. So you can see here, there's a squeezing rate. Remember that we, we did the stretching. Yeah. We compress the waveform. So here it's uh, totally one, 150 seconds, but the, the stretch squeezing rate is four. That means it's actually 600 waveform. We squeeze into a one, 150. So this is actually S wave. Yeah, it's actually S wave. Yeah, it finds S wave as well. And this is an, another example uh, for the overlapped spectrum between the signal and the noise. And the, the man-made noise waveform is uh, weird, looks weird, but the prediction is good. And now we wanna apply this uh, technique to, uh, to the deep earthquakes. The reason of using deep, deep earthquakes as application, uh, many for two reasons. First, 
uh, the the P wave signal of the deep earthquakes are direct P wave phases. Is well uh, separated from the depth phases and the following set phases. So by looking at the P wave of the deep earthquakes, we can um, better uh, approximate the source time function of the earthquake. So we can so so that we can better understand the source character characteristics of the deep earthquake. And second reason is that um, the the deep waves, the, the deep earthquakes, the, the way the wave of the second wave of deep earthquakes travel down and then travel up to our stations. So it doesn't have a very complex source size structure because it's deep, although the slab structure may be complex, but it's much simpler than the shallow earthquakes, for example, in the shallow subduction zone. So these are two main reasons. There's a third reason is that um, if we look at the, the intensity caused by a deeper earthquake and a shallow earthquake, which are um, the, the red and blue, the blue is actually the Tokuku Oki earthquake. So the intensity field in the global region, in the, in the global area, is that uh, we, we mainly feel the shallow earthquake, uh, we mainly feel the shallow earthquakes surrounding this uh, source region, but we can fill in a widespread area for the deeper earthquakes. So by looking at deeper earthquakes, we can better recover the source characteristics because um, the energy are well spread to the spread it to the test estimate distances. So here's an example of denoising. Um, the left figure shows the signal to noise ratio be before and after denoising. The red is after. So it's improved, and uh, the this, this this column this column the left column of the waveforms are the raw data, and on the right shows uh, we show the denoise waveform. These waveforms are arranged a time series arranged by the atmos. It's a record section arranged by atmos. So you can see that apparently the pre P wave signals are removed, and the P wave signal itself has been well preserved. It looks similar to the stacking. The stacking of the denoise waveform are similar to the, the pulse before denoising. That means uh, the feature of the P wave is preserved, but noise is gone. So this is, we have achieved our target for this earthquake. And if we convert the time series to a spectrum and uh, do a stacking, we can get a stacked, we can get a, a stacked spectrum, which is showing green. And uh, we can also use a theoretical model to, prove, to, to model this um, spectrum using these um, equations. And we found that after denoising, um, the stacked spectrum looks more similar to the model predictions. So that means uh, it may be more reasonable result. And we can rely more on the denoise spectrum. And uh, we, we, we also look at the uh, the duration of, of each individual seismogram on each station. And we can do a like stretching of each station of each seismogram with a stack result. Then we can get a overall as a most as a most pattern of the relative duration of the seismogram so that we can uh, to use it to infer the directivity of the rupture. So here an example, before we do denoising, the, the relative duration is it's random, it's quite random. It's not, it doesn't follow any, 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 any uh, relation with the animals. But after denoising, what we get is that uh, the, the relative duration in all animals are equal, almost equal. That means there's no directivity for this event. This means this event could be a bilateral rupture. So this is a very uh, important parameters for the earthquake rupture. And we also look at the, the distribution on the takeoff angle is also, um, more reasonable. It's also more uniform after denoising, but before denoising is also random. So we cannot we cannot rely on the relative duration before the denoising, but we can rely on the denoising result. And the figure on the right shows a comparison between uh, the relative ratio, relative duration ratio, relative duration uh, with the radiation pattern of this earthquake. So this earthquake should be a uh, deep sleep. And there's no apparent directivity for this earthquake. And here I'm showing you more example of um, denoising the time series. Of course, the spectrum is similar. Um, the left is a noisy waveform, and the right is denoised. The performance is pretty good for both uh, magnitude five and magnitude six. 
Um, yeah. And even though for this uh, big earthquake, for this large event, uh, magnitude 6.5, which is quite large, before we denoising, the, the duration cannot be, can't be well measured. But after denoising, the measurement of the duration is more reasonable. And here, uh, we do an overall stacking of um, different group of magnitudes um, of the denoiser waveform. The left is noisy using the noisy waveform. The right is using the noisy waveform. And each line here is, uh, is average. And uh, after push trapping, there are some uh, processing steps. So it's average. The, the, the red waveform, the red curve here is the average spectrum of each magnitude, magnitude group. And after denoising, we, 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 we find that um, the average spectra fit are more more uh, systematic and uh, looks similar more similar to the model predictions the prediction of a, of a physical model and uh, with the denoise waveform we we have a better spectra we have a better time series so that we can estimate the radiation energy for each earthquake what we do is that is that we do integration for the spectrum for example um this earthquake, we integrate this spectrum and uh, make some corrections for the uh, attenuation so that we can estimate the radiation energy, radiated energy for this earthquake. So this is a result we obtain uh, before denoising and after denoising. So the x-axis is a moment of each earthquake uh, converted from the moment magnitude. And the y-axis is a radiated energy. And we can, uh, we can see that um, after denoising, the, all, the, all the measurements are confined to a narrow range. This is a good sign that uh, we can have a better um, scaling estimated from this um, data. And uh, if, we, if we further look into the difference between different colors, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to put the color bar here. So basically the red represents, the rest of course represents shallow earthquakes, shallow than 300 which is the range uh, for depth range for intermediate depth earthquake. And the blue ones are deep ones, deep, fo deep focus, uh, deeper than 300 kilometers. So we can see that they are, they, are, they are different actually. So if we separate them, this is a denoiser result. Separate them, we can see that um, they follow different scaling. They have different slope uh, for the best fit line. This indicate that uh, the intermediate depth earthquake and the deep focus earthquake may have different rupture process or different rupture mechanism. So um, this is what we observe from the denoiser data. And uh, we, we plot this, uh, we also calculate, because we, we have already measured the, the duration of the denoiser waveform, then we can scale it to a certain magnitude to compare the scaled um, source duration for the global earthquakes that we have denoised. So here, um, the two figures on the bottom shows the measurement of the scale duration directly from time and the, the measurement of the scale duration from the corner frequency. They are actually different. Theoretically, they should uh, be similar, but what we got is very different. And uh, this is a global pattern of the measurement of the time series, the duration of the time series. And we can see that uh, there are some lateral difference, lateral variations for different subduction zones or different regions. For example, um, in the region near Peru, uh, the measurement of the scale duration is shorter. That means the rupture process of earthquake here in this region maybe may have a shorter process. Sorry. It's from a time domain. Yeah. So I didn't plot uh, the scale duration for the frequency, corner frequency, because I want to make a direct measurement from the time. Maybe there are some errors. I don't know in, in which the error is larger, so yeah. And this is a consistent, consistent feature um, to the previous studies, actually. And uh, we also plot the energy. This figure is, um, has, shown, has been shown before. So this is a global distribution of uh, the rated energy. Um, here, we, we convert the rated energy to the apparent stress by dividing the rated energy by the moment and times the shear modulus or rigidity, we can get the global distribution of uh, the parent stress. And we can see some lateral difference. Also take uh, the South America as an example is that um, the region near Peru, 
um, shows a uh, clearly higher apparent stress for the deep earthquakes. Using, uh, one one component. Using a, a 1D model? Yeah, 1D average. Can those variations be explained by differences in shear modulus that's observed by thermographers? Um, that will produce a difference if I use different shear modulus. So here I use a constant shear modulus. Yeah. But like if you use the range of shear modulus that was observed by the thermography model, does that explain the range observed here? That's, well, that's very interesting. Um, Yes, I want to try that. We will try that, um, try different models to see if it can be expanded by the structure difference by different regions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when you apply demerging, some earthquakes show improvement, some some earthquakes show less improvement, some, some earthquakes show more improvement. Yep. So uh, were we able to confirm that the earthquakes that show less improvement were originally the ones which, which have lower noise? Uh, not necessary. I have looked through all the the, the denoising examples. It's not necessary. I'm it, really concerned about the improvement that we are seeing and how they relate to the noise in the origin of Yeah, we, we can have a statistics of the performance over um, the input signal to noise ratio. We can do that. But from my uh, my my eye inspection, um, it's not the, that case. It not, it's not strongly based on the input signal to noise ratio. It also has some uh, effects from the, the, the spectrum difference between the signal and noise. Yeah, so this is uh, the last slide I want to show. Um, yeah, we, we, we have two measurements of um, the source duration. So here, uh, these two panels shows a direct measurement from the time domain to measure the pulse width to uh, estimate the duration. And uh, these two panels shows the measurement of the duration from the corner frequency. It's one over corner frequency. And uh, they follow, after denoising, they follow the same slope, uh, which is uh, the, the duration should be uh, proportional to moment to the power of one over four. And uh, we also, similar, we also have uh, the measurement uh, we, we, we will convert this duration to the scale duration to compare all the durations um, at the same magnitude and the same uh, velocity model or same uh, as well as velocity. We want to see uh, the depth dependent feature of this uh, scale duration. And the top two figures shows the measurements for the duration, scaling law for the duration and the scaling law for the scale duration from the previous studies um, by uh, Persh and Houston. And uh, I think some features here are, are similar or opposite. For example, they observe um, a larger slope for deeper earthquakes, but here we observe larger slope uh, for the shallow earthquakes in this um, scaling of the source duration. And uh, on the right, they predict a overall reduced scale duration for the deeper earthquake, but what we get uh, is a slightly increase for the deeper earthquake. So this is some uh, difference between our study, our result and the previous study I wanna show here. And uh, so far I don't have a good uh, uh, interpretation to, uh, for this uh, difference between the studies. And uh, the take home message is that um, we can use transfer learning from a um, unit to denoise the test estimate P waves. And uh, we can, improve the, the, the waveforms in both the time domain and the frequency domain, as you can see in the previous figures. And uh, we, we measured the denoise waveform for the um, duration and energy. And we found a different scaling law between different depth range. And uh, the corner frequency shows a um, higher scaled duration, which means um, the deeper, for deeper aspect, that means the deeper earthquake may have a longer rupture process or slower rupture process, but we, we cannot make any uh, interpretation here. And uh, this same technique, technique can be applied to other uh, seismograms in the future. For example, our next target is S-wave. And after that, we will do surface wave. Yeah, that's all of my talk. Thank you.
Okay, so we're at the top of the hour. If you need to head off to your next meeting, feel free to take off. Otherwise, we'll take a couple questions. To the slide where you where you uh, there stop forward uh, just yeah so um, that was uh, back more oh back more where you constructed the the on by bid data set oh yeah um here yes so I guess if you're if you're stretching waveforms to create an augmented data set is it is it clear i mean could could the pattern of radiated energy just be because this assumes this type of stretching assumes some sort of self-similarity because you, you end up having uh, better precision you have your observations you know collapsing closer to a curve with mm -hmm. theory but that reduced variability could just be because you Done this stretching, which assumes self similarity. Does, does that make sense? Oh, yeah, amplitude is normalized. Energy. Yeah, always oh. scale to one. Yeah. Thank you. So also, something you like to talk about the data augmentation is when you have your training data set and your testing data set, um, I think that the original training data. The augmentation for that don't lead into testing data set. So yeah, same augmentation down for the test, test set. Right, but it does hurt you the augmentation or does it hurt the same? Yeah. 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 As with a large portion for training and a small portion for testing. And then the augmentation. Yes, both. Yes. So we had a question from Heidi. Heidi, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi. A uh, very nice talk. Um could you go forward uh, to show some data from deep earthquakes, some seismograms? Uh, yeah, okay, maybe that, maybe this one. Um, actually, I think the previous one might be good. Just go back one. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> this is one earthquake, yes. uh, right? Yep. And if it sort of seems like this process removes some of the directivity, um, which would be manifest in having different corner frequencies for the different stations. Um, okay, I, I want to add more add one more thing here. Um, so the seismogram, the time series you are seeing here. In the record section, it's actually um, stretched waveform. We we stretched each each trace oh. to achieve the highest cross, cross correlation between this trace and the stacked waveform. I so, see. So that's why maybe you that's maybe the reason uh, you see a, a loss of the activity is actually our we 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 estimated that activity by by doing this stretching cross correlation. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, yeah. yeah. So. I don't really have any explanation for the difference between your result and our result. Um, as, as you probably know, we did all these studies in the time domain um, with really careful stacking of all the available teleseismic uh, seismograms and looking at them in acceleration, velocity, and displacement to try to um, pick the start and end of them. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a very careful quality control. Um, I think by doing denoising, uh, maybe we can reduce our time on that um, quality control. Maybe I, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and I, I think the the major difference between uh, the two results is uh, from the estimation on the corner frequency. If we if we look at the the, the, the estimation from the time domain. It may not be that um, different, but for the estimation from the corner frequency, it's more different. Okay. Yeah. So we were entirely in the time domain for this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting, sort of amazing thing you can do. Um, should yep. be very helpful. 
Yeah, um, this, this area is quite new to me. So I, I guess uh, I need to read more to understand the difference between results. Maybe we can come up with uh, some explanation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's stop there. We're at the top of the hour. Let's say should do one more time. Thank you.